Tuttle's method now that he used um, to derive so many interesting things. Well, one of the things that he gave us is called the syllogism. What is that? He says, well, there's a major premise and a minor premise. Major just means first and minor just means second. The major premise is, let's say all A's are B's. And let's say in the, in the second premise that all B's are C's. Well, then it would follow that all A's must also be C's. So let's say that all LUM students are Geniuses. Geniuses. <laughs> right? And um, all geniuses are uh, um, under the age of 25, then it would follow that all LUM students must also be under the age of 25. Or some rubbish <laughs> like that. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about the syllogism is it's quite logical and straightforward, and we've learned to apply it in so many different ways and so many different things. But the thing is, that the argument becomes true. The argument is true by default. Um, the structure of the argument is always going to be true. The only time the argument can be untrue is if either the, one of the premises are un, is untrue. Are all LAM students are geniuses. That obviously is totally untrue. Uh, all geniuses are under the age of 25 is also totally untrue. So therefore, the conclusion is also untrue. Or if you made a mistake somewhere, and you derive conclusions that are not the premises. Yes? Sir, aren't we negating change over here? Are we getting that when B change ni hoga, we will always be B? Beautiful question. Excellent question. But I'm going to come to that in just a bit, not right now. Okay? Keep that question in mind all of you. So from here, he derives the law of deductive reasoning, laws, the three laws of deductive reasoning. And I'd like you to write this down. First is the law of identity. What does law of identity mean? It means A is A. Good grief. That sounds like a tautology. And it is, in fact. It's completely tautological. It's like saying Temur is Temur. I mean, kya is me khas baat? If I went to a conference and I said 1 is equal to 1, you know, 2 is equal to 2, or A is equal to A, probably slap me silly and say, did I pay your air ticket just to come and tell me this? But the second conclusion is the most interesting. <coughs> Derived directly out of the first one. If A is equal to A, then it cannot be that A, then there must be that A is not equal to not A. What? If A is A, then all of that, that which is not A is not A. <laughs> what? What does that mean? That means Two contradictory hypotheses cannot simultaneously be true. Now we're getting started. Two directly contradictory hypotheses cannot be true at the same time. If I say it's raining outside, that's one hypothesis. If what's the opposite of it's raining outside? It's not raining outside, or it's sunny outside. Well. Not raining is actually more correct than sunny, because it can actually rain when it's, it's sunny as well. The clouds can be here and the sun can be here, in which case you're getting both. So um, either it's raining outside or it's not raining outside. One of the two is true and the other is not true. Both cannot be true at the same time. That's what he's trying to say. And if you come up with any hypothesis, in which two things, two contradictory hypotheses seem to be true at the same time. That means that you've done something wrong. Now, if you really think back to my previous lecture, this was the essence of dialectics. This is exactly what Socrates was trying to do. Is he was trying to tease out the contradictions in an argument. He was trying to show you that uh, two contradictory things can be true. And finally says, he comes up with the law of the excluded middle. Among two contradictory pr propositions, one must be true and the other must be false. So if they're exactly the opposite of each other, it's raining and it's not raining, <coughs> it's day and it's not day, it's day and it's night, then it has to be the case that either one or the other is true. Right? There's no third possibility. So that's why we call it the law of the excluded middle, the law of the excluded third. There's no third possibility between true, two, truly dialectically opposite hypotheses. 
Now, in, this is very useful in statistics. What do we use? How many of you have done statistics or econometrics or something? OK. So you must be familiar already. What am I talking about? How is this useful in statistics? My statistician, you tell me. With bar, sir. Oh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Exactly now. When we want to find out, when we utilize statistics, and we want to find out confidence variables and other things, etc., etc., we don't actually work with a hypothesis. We work with a null hypothesis, which is the exact opposite of the hypothesis that we create. And we try to find whether we can prove or disprove that. If we disprove the null hypothesis, it means that the other hypothesis has to be true. If the, under the law of the excluded middle, that the null hypothesis is truly is the null hypothesis. Am I right? In terms of statistics? Yes, I'm always right, but anyway, that's not the point. The point is, these are the three laws. And you can pass through, you can pass various arguments about the world through these hypotheses to see whether something has a logical fallacy within it. So the law of the excluded middle should not be confused, by the way, with the fallacy of the excluded middle. You know what the fallacy of the excluded middle is? It's the most common error on Facebook that people make when they're arguing with each other. What's the fallacy of the excluded middle? It's also called a false dichotomy. What's a false dichotomy? What's a dichotomy? Yes? Two sides to a position. Yes, exactly. Two sides to a position. So what's a false dichotomy? Assuming that there are only two sides to the position. Exactly right. Beautifully said. Or assuming that the two sides are exactly contradictory to each other, right? That would be a false dichotomy. That there's no third side. So if George Bush says, either you are with us or you are against us, <coughs> that is a pure false dichotomy. Because I could be, you know, against you and I could be against the Tal Taliban at the same time, couldn't I? I could be, or I could be with both at the same time. That's also possible, etc. So a false dichotomy is, is an argument like saying, agar Nawaz Sharif <laughs> the only choice is Imran Khan. That's actually a false dichotomy because there are lots of other choices. There are 358 political parties in the country, right? So that's not really, you know, when you try to create these false dichotomies so that when you, when you smash one, people will automatically say, oh, okay, now I'm going for Imran Khan or I'm going for Nawaz or I'm going for Zadari or I'm going for this or I'm going for that. Politicians do that all the time. They create false dichotomies all the time. So, uh, uh, Aristotle would help us to understand what is a true dichotomy, and in a true dichotomy, this would be true that two contradictory hypotheses would not be correct, but in a false dichotomy, they would not. So these these were the laws of deductive logic. <coughs> that he would have been. And if you study logic with uh, Shabir Essen or, or uh, take any philosophy course on logic, this is where you begin. You begin with these three first laws of logic. Any time somebody says laws of logic, what are they? they this is what they are. And you can put them in, uh, you can put them in these, uh, you know, those uh, formula, formulaic, formulaic uh, algebraic terms. A is equal to A. A, a is not equal to not A. Um, uh, if there are two contradictory uh, hypotheses, A and not A, then either one or the other must be true. Because the V sign is either one or the other is true. Okay. We don't. You're not going to be tested on the laws of logic because this course is not about logic. But you must be familiar with how Aristotle formulated these laws and what these laws were. Secondly, he comes up with the method of induction. So the question that somebody asked of it was in empiricist. Um, you can see that he's going to use both methods. He's not just interested in deduction, but he's also interested in induction. What is induction? Induction is when you take lots and lots of individual particular uh, things, and then you take, make a generalization out of them. For example, 85% of high school students are colorblind. If that is true, and Allen is one of the, uh, is, a, is a student. So Al Alan is 85%. Uh, the probability is 85% <coughs> that he is also color, Alan is also color black. That's induction. But the problem with the induction is it only takes one example to destroy a generalization from induction. So let's say I see a crow and it's black, and I say, OK. Then I see another crow and it's black, and I see a third crow. I see one million crows, and they're all bloody black, right? Does that mean all crows are black? That like crows are black? From the, purely from the inductive method, I cannot come to that conclusion. I can come to the conclusion that the probability is, there's a high probability that all crows are black. But I cannot come to the definitive conclusion that all crows are black. Because some bloody crow might be white. 
that I don't know. Okay? So induction, therefore, does not give you, deduction gives you very hard sort of uh, generalizations. Induction gives you probabilities, but not hard sort of conclusions. But Aristotle thinks that both are very useful. With induction, you can come to certain generalizations, and then you can test them deductively to see whether they hold true or not. And those are the methods that he was going to use. With respect to nature, he divided nature into living and non-living things. <coughs> he said that um, uh, nature changes to external influence. Amongst living things, he said those who have the potential for change internally and those who have the potential for change externally. Those who have the potential for change internally are living things like plants and creatures. And those who change externally are uh, inanimate things like rocks and so on. Creatures are, can be divided into animals and humans. There are no sharp boundaries in the natural world. Um, so, you know, somebody can be in between an animal and a human, like most young students are. Um, there is a gradual transition, he's saying, from, the simple, uh, from simple growths to more complicated plants, from simple animals to more complicated animals. And you can see, you know, that you can see the beginnings of an understanding of evolutionary theory even over here. Man has the spark of divine reason. The movement of the stars and the planets guide all movements the, on Earth, he believed. The movement of the stars and planets was caused by the first mover, which he also, sometimes also calls God. The first mover is itself addressed, but it is the formal cause of the movement of the heavenly bodies and thus of all movement in nature. We're going to skip over this quickly. Ah, now we come to ethics. This is the now, this is the most important thing. Now, what did Plato say about ethics? What, 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 is it eth what is ethical? What is virtuous? What's good? Yes. Knowing that is courage for knowledge. That's it. It's very simple. Virtue is knowledge. Write that down. Virtue is knowledge. You can sum up all of Plato and Aristotle in these three words. So, but, so the good life, according to Plato, is, could be a life of utter destitute unhappiness. But if it is spent in the pursuit of knowledge, it is the good life. You are miserable, you are bloody manic, depressive, you are slitting your wrists, wrists every three days. But because you, you, you created, you, you discovered the theory of relativity or something, that's the good life, according to Plato. But you are unhappy, says Aristotle. How can that be a good life? So for Aristotle, he says, there are three forms of happiness that we have. What are they? Well, first of all, is a life of pleasure and enjoyment. I go out with my friends, I go to eat at Nando's, I have a chocolate cake. Oh my God, it is so sweet. It has <coughs> enough calories to last you for an entire week. And I am over the moon, I'm happy. Okay, it's not some great intellectual activity, but I like it, okay? Don't you ever watch silly serials that you know are not very intelligent? But you go home and you watch them. What's some silly, silly serials that you watch that are not intellectually stimulating, but you like watching them anyway? Or movies or whatever? Friends. Yeah. Friends! Good grief! That's such a good example. I mean, what is that thing even all about? It's just all silly jokes, one after the other, am I right? Um, I've forget, forgotten the characters, but one character is chasing one girl, the other character is chasing another girl, and this keeps going round and round like that. For how many seasons? Yeah. Ten. 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 <laughs> what are some of the other serials that you like? What are some of the other things you enjoy doing? Just anything that's, that's pleasurable for you. Good fun, good clean, happy fun, makes you happy as well. Tell me. Big Bang Theory. Sorry? The Big Bang Theory. What? Yeah. The Big Bang Theory? Makes you happy? <laughs> it's a show. It's a show. Oh, the show! <laughs> Okay. Other things, aside from watching TV, TV makes you happy. The idiot box makes you happy. <laughs> what else makes you happy? Sports? Raise your hands. Yeah, I, I, I feel very happy when I play sports. Not when I break my arm or bones, etc. But I'm <coughs> what else? Sleeping in the morning. Okay, fine. Sleeping in the morning. Sleeping makes you happy. There's no doubt about that. If you sleep less, by the way, you become unhappy. Did you know that? Depression is uh, very easily correlated with uh, number one, lack of sleep, and number two, lack of sunlight. So if you sleep late at night and you sleep less, that's the best way to get depressed. <laughs> yeah, if you sleep at 4 a.m., which is what most of you students do, Charvis and Pelican so bad. Jude Ball. Teen Messi Pelican so bad. 
दो में से पहले कौन सा होता है एक में से पहले कौन सा होता है और बारह में से पहले कौन सा होता है कोई भी नहीं तो अच्छा बाय द वे मैं तो आई यूज टू बी वन ऑफ यू आई यूज टू स्लीप लाइक एट थ्री ए एम आराम से थ्री एम वॉज माई यूजल टाइम टू एम बिटवीन टू एम एंड थ्री एम मोस्ट टाइम गोल्ड स्लीप एवर सिंस आई हैड डॉटर्स That has completely gone out of the window. Now I am up at 7:30 a.m. standing on saloon, take a bath, get ready, take my daughter to school, etc. And I tell you, I'm such a happier person as a result. I can't even begin to tell you what a transformation it has made in my life. It's really wonderful to wake up early in the morning. You get more sunlight, which produces more vitamin D, and so on. And you get less depressed. These are well-known facts. You know this, right? Raise your hand if you know this. Oh, this is not very few know this. Okay. Also, eight hours of sleep is absolutely necessary. You know, when uh, one time they did this experiment in school, where uh, they subah saath baje chhe baje school lagte hote the na purani zamane mein, hamare zamane mein to subah chhe baje ham uthe school jaya karte the. To unhone kya kiya ki nine baje school gana shuru kar diya, or gave teenagers an extra hour to sleep in, etc., etc. And sometimes they even said, okay, in the first period we'll have some voluntary activity. If you want to sleep, you can just go to sleep. <laughs> and they discovered that student attention spans shot up through the roof and their performance shot up through the roof because sleep is highly correlated a full night's rest is highly correlated with the uh, uh, mental and physical performance if i want to beat an athlete you could have you could be the best athlete under the sun if we have a football match tomorrow i'm going to make sure you don't get any sleep the night before Uh, you know they do this uh, sort of to defeat other teams, etc. They keep them up all night, etc. Send girls to their room, send you know drugs to their room and alcohol, etc. To their enemy team's room. Make sure they party as hard as possible in the morning. They're like, where's the ball? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, they do, I mean, they do this all the time in, in professional sports. But, you know, not here in Pakistan, but in in the West they do it all. The time. Try and do it all the time. Big money behind sports, so they do it all. The time. But yeah, it's 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 very key. So go to bed early and wake up early, and trust me, you will be so much happier as a person. Second is the life of a responsible citizen. Oh, so this is something a little more than just about your pleasure, but it's also about making the world a better place. You pick up the trash, you go to some good demonstrations, you work for human rights, you help out with, uh, you share on social media anything to do with Nakib or that boy that was shot by the Rangers or. Um, Mashal Khan, whatever. You feel good about yourself. You're like, oh, I did the P2P project. I'm such a good person. I'm a good and responsible citizen. Of course, most of you didn't want to do the P2P project, which is why you fail right here. <laughs> you're not to be responsible. But he says this is also very important. And last but certainly not least is to be a thinker and philosopher. You need a balance of all these three things in your life, says Aristotle. If you don't have a balance, if you're doing, if you've been a thinker and philosopher all the bloody time. All work and no play makes for a very dull boy, a very dull person. You're not going to have a life of pleasure. You're not going to be free. Such obvious. Sit down, read books, 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 You got to do these things. It's very important for your for your uh, for your well-being, for your emotional and mental well-being. But if that's all you're doing, if you become a party boy or a party girl, then you're not going to be happy, okay? Because that, that's all you're doing. You're not you know you're not being a responsible citizen. So you got to spend some time doing things for others. Doing things for others also makes you happy, says Aristotle. Makes the society a better place, makes the environment better, and so on. And finally, you've got to think about the deeper things as well. You, there's got to be more to life than just being, you know, a fun-loving person who also does things for other people, etc. There has to be more to be a truly interesting person, and that's the golden mean. Mianna Ravi Karastani says, which uh, of course is also there in our religion. Neither cowardly nor rash, but courageous. Every every virtue <coughs> is basically a mean, the middle path between two extremes. You can either be rash, oh, more 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 scores, thappar pare, you have to take it pare, you have to. Ya, apni tarah darey ho ki ap awazi na uthaye aur ap kahi na ki ye galat hai, ya iske khilaf ho. 
A courageous person always stands in the middle. He knows when to, to struggle and when to back off. Neither uh, extravagant nor, that's not amazing, that should be some other word. Um, neither stingy nor extravagant. But liberal, right? You, you don't want to be a stingy person. I have bubble gum. I have four of them. And you don't want to be like, Oh, yeah, you're also eating. 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 You want to find a middle ground, he says. The nice thing about human nature, though, is that man is naturally gregarious. He wants to live with other people. He's social. In fact, uh, Aristotle says, man is by nature a political animal. He wants to have fellowship. And this can be only be found in coming together to make a government, to make a state. It's natural to make a state. People want that. And man achieves his potential only, not in the state of nature, but when you make a government, a good government with law-abiding citizens. And this government must accord to natural law. What is natural law? Natural law is that which is bequeathed to us from nature. It's a part of us. So the state itself is a natural organism and must accord to natural law. Uh, and our political obligations must be based on natural law. The state, uh, as I already said, is the natural organism. And this leads us to what Aristotle what in Aristotle's time was called the city state. Aristotle thought the city state should be small. If the state is a lot of people, it becomes incapable of constitutional government and democracy and ethical and political unity. And by small, he meant that's not looks like any other thing. Okay, so it was very small, like it was the size of lungs, really, it was the size of the city state. And for Plato, he says, first of all, Plato has completely neglected to analyze the life of the majority, which are workers up to the bottom, उनको तो एनालाइज ही नहीं किया प्लेटो ने सारा अपना टाइम गार्डियंस पे स्पेंड कर दिया कि गार्डियंस ऐसे होने चाहिए वैसे होने चाहिए सारी डिबेट ही इस पे होती थी बट ही डिड एनालाइज एट ऑल द पीपल हु एक्चुअली द मेजॉरिटी ऑफ पीपल ऑफ अ सोसाइटी हु एक्चुअली प्रोड्यूस द थिंग्स दैट वी यूज ही आल्सो कंप्लीटली डिसएग्रीड विद द आईडिया ऑफ कम्युनिटी ऑफ वाइज एंड चिल्ड्रन एज 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 पब्लिक प्रॉपर्टी ही थॉट ओह माय गॉड आई मीन इफ द गार्डियंस वुड डिप्राइव्ड ऑफ प्रॉपर्टी and if they were deprived, they could not marry, and they could not have freaking children. They would be the most unhappiest people on the bloody planet. They would be miserable. And it, how could miserable people make the rest of society happy? They would never know what the rest of society even wants. You can't have miserable people running this country. Okay? So any, if, if, if that part of the state, which was running the state, was deprived of happiness, then the whole state could not attain happiness, because those people would not aspire to happiness, would not know happiness. And also, he, he said, property is a good thing. He said, property stimulates you. If when you want to get more property, it stimulates you to, to, to find new ways to make money and develop new things and sell commodities and do all these sort of things. It incentivizes you to make money. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, he says. Same with wives and children. They incentivize you to work for them. क्योंकि को मेरे ताल्लुक आती नहीं समाजी जब मेरे को ताल्लुक आती नहीं समाजी तो मैं किस तरह समाजी रिश्तों को समझूं और अगर मैं समाजी रिश्तों को नहीं समझ सकता तो मैं किस तरह समाज के रिश्तों को बेहतर करूं है ना कितनी एब्सर्ड आर्गुमेंट है नाउ दैट यू थिंक अबाउट इट सर आपने पिछले हफ्ते इतनी डिबेट की थी आज आप उलट हो गए अच्छा सो व्हाट एरिस्टोटल वांटेड टू डू इंस्टेड वाज ही सेड यू नो इंस्टेड ऑफ क्रिएटिंग दिस आइडियल रिपब्लिक दिस पाई इन द स्काई and then seeing whether in real republics accord to that or not. This is a nonsense method. This is derived from Plato's uh, ridiculous view that ideal forms exist and everything else is a copy of those ideal forms. He's trying to create an ideal form of the state and then utilize that to examine things. This is the wrong way to go about to study politics. The way you should study politics is you should look at actually what exists on the ground and then deny the ideal from there, ideals from there, understand there understand what's going on. So what he did was he sent his students out to collect all the laws that existed in the city states around him and then he sat down and he studied them all. Because he was a meticulous guy that way. You know, Plato liked to just sit with one premise in his mind and from that premise he would then break down into so many beautiful ideas. But Aristotle was the opposite. He took all the ideas that existed and from them distilled what he thought were the important ideas. So the idea that he came up with was well, we can see that in different states, either there's one ruler, or there are a few rulers, or there are many, many rulers. That's what we see first of all. And then we see 
that there are good or bad versions of each. Sometimes you have one ruler that, and the, those states are running quite well. A few rulers in those states are running quite well. Many rulers in those states are running quite well. And sometimes you have the same states and they're not running well. When the states are running well with one ruler, we'll call it a kingship. When they're running poorly, we'll call it tyranny. When a state has few rulers uh, and they're running well, we'll call it an aristocracy. And when it's running poorly, we'll call it an oligarchy. And when you have many rulers <coughs> and they're running well, we will call it a polity. And when it's running badly, what are we going to call it? Democracy. A democracy. Okay. It's kind of funny. So what does it mean when he says states are running good or bad? Well, he's, you remember he said in his teleology that all things can be categorized and determined by their end. What's the teleology? What is the state aspiring towards? Cities by which he means states, were bad according to the end they set themselves. If they sought the welfare of the whole, they were good. If the welfare of only a part, they were bad. What's the end? Pakistan ka maksad kya? Lai, 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 obviously, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, as soon as I said that, I was like, dude, that just, I mean, that. What's the end goal of Pakistan, right? I mean, what kind of society do you want to be? Do you want that's really what's going to determine whether you're running things up well or not. Not whether you're being run by one person or three or five or six or by a lot of people. But what's the end goal? If the object of the state was bad, then the citizen who fulfills that object was a bad man, but a good citizen. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. You could be a bad person and a good citizen, a good citizen and um, a bad citizen and a good person. So if you lived in Nazi Germany, and you want to be a good righteous citizen and said, these bloody Yehudis, I'm going to put a star of David on, the, you know, on their houses and I'm going to discriminate against them. Later on, of course, I'll send them to the gas chamber, kill about a million, two million, six million of them, and so on. So. You were obeying the law. During the Nuremberg trials, that's what all the Nazi fascists said. I was acting as a good citizen. Yes, you were acting as a good citizen, but you were acting as a bad person. You were acting as a, uh, a good state, you were acting as a bad person. You were acting as a good state would protect property, and more importantly, would present the, the positive good in order to bring its citizens to the best life. That's the purpose. Aristotle was also amongst the first people to have understood not just that, that classes exist in politics, not just as Aristotle, as Plato said, that classes would exist in politics, but that the clash between classes was what determined politics. This is amazing. This is like, you know, Marxism before Marx. <coughs> clash of factions, factions is the same as classes, that the representative, clash of factions that they represented, the class of factions represented class interests. Athens versus Smarta, democracy versus aristocracy. Aristotle gave to the world definitions of political terms which, is not, which it has not yet had to supersede. Can you imagine? I mean, previously, many of those terms are supposed democracy and polity and oligarchy and aristocracy. Yeah, abhi tak hum woh terms istemal kar rahe. Kya bande ki throw ma thi, pitch thi, ke matlab bhai hazar saal guzar gaye aur aaj tak hum usi ki terms istemal kar rahe. Amazing. So opposition to democracy is the result of a revolution against plutocracy. Democracy, and this, I think Aristotle gives the best definition of democracy that any political scientist gives. He says democracy is when the poor and not the men of property are the rulers. That's what we call democracy. In fact, simply derived from the fact that demo, demos meant the people without property in ancient Greece. In a democracy, the poor will have more power than the rich, because there are more of them, and the will of the majority will always be supreme. Now, here's the interesting thing. Aristotle does not think that's a good idea. He is against democracy. This is the shocking part, that both Plato, we often think, oh, you know, Greeks invented democracy. Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, they spoke about democracy. Yeah, they spoke about it, but they bloody condemned it. They were totally opposed to it. This is a shocking bit. Democracy, he says, is inferior to aristocracy because it is based on the false assumption of equality of all citizens. Their intellectual equality. 
The problem arises from the idea that those who are equal under the law are equal in all other respects. Because people are so easily misled and so fickle, changeable in their views, the ballot should be limited only to the intelligent. Take care, PhD Hassel. Karo, Pira ko vote de lega, de lega. Usse pehle, nada, nishta. He was opposed to open elections, as this would make government subservient to the ignorant mass of citizens. They would be more brutal. He advocated the selection of magistrates by lot from amongst the recognized aristocracy. And he hoped, in fact, not to create a revolution, but in fact to eradicate the democratic revolution that was going on. His main goal in writing on politics is how do we save ourselves from a democratic revolution? He says political authority should be distributed through the different sections of the state to check unrest and revolution. Written laws is a guarantee against the instability of men who could be swayed by passion. Laws should be written down. Number three, mixed form of government only between various factions to prevent a revolution. Thodi si power in Bongo de to, si power in aristocracy ko de to, thodi si power king ko de to. Mix bana. Take care. Take koi bi faction, dusre faction ko parna. Divide and rule. Distribution of goods should be made to the whole community. He also condemned usury. That's taking interest. And he said, friendship, you know, is the best check of treachery. Friendship is the greatest good which can happen to any city as nothing so much prevents sedition. But his best views I've saved for last. His best views were on women. What was his Plato, as I told you, was quite progressive as far as women were concerned. He said, you know, what did he say? Fatma? <laughs> What did Plato say that, uh, you know, uh, if you don't train your women, it's like a fighter that only trains one arm, you know. You've got to train both. And women, women and men both can be part of the guardian class. That was Aristotle's view. First of all, he said women, they're the unfinished men. They're the unfinished men. First of all, he said women were unfinished men. Right. Um, woman is an unfinished man, left standing on a lower step in the scale of development. Avadim? There are horses in the there, there are even better pearls of wisdom coming. So, man provides the form and woman contributes the substance. Man was the sower and woman the soil. Children inherit only main char male characteristics. But they have not been able to do it. They have not His idea of procreation is <coughs> active, ensouling masculine, it was that an active, ensouling masculine element brought life to a passive female element. And this is my favorite part. With a woman is more mischievous, less simple, more impulsive, more compassionate, more easily moved to tears. Come on, boys, you know this. More jealous, oh my god, are you kidding? Of course. More quarrelous, more apt to scold and to strike, more prone to despondency and less hopeful, more void of shame or self-respect, more false of speech, more deceptive or uh, or more retentive of memory and also more wakeful, more shrinking and more difficult to rouse to action. I can tell you we had a bad marriage. <laughs> Is this true? Okay, yes. Okay. Let's, just, let's think about it. What is more mischievous? Sharati. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Is it? I mean, when, when my child, my Gonzara does something Less simple. Okay, so you're more complex, so guys are simple. Isn't that true, Vessel? No. Uh, we just want to watch TV and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, yeah. That's like the typical stereotype of guys. Are simple. So the Vessel, Aristotle said, okay, your teleology lies in uh, you, uh, when you attain your most common. So you want to become a woman? <laughs> so, if you're all men and women, and women are more complex than men, that means they are more achieved than Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. What an excellent point. More impulsive, that's not necessarily bad either. Is it bad to be more impulsive? I mean, to be less impulsive means to be something is happening and you know, you just, not, just don't care about it. More compassionate. Is that true, is it? Women are mothers, they're trained to be mothers, they're socialized to be mothers, they're naturally mothers, etc. So they're more compassionate. How many wars are started by women? More easily moved to tears. I mean, if a guy starts crying, we give him a slap across the face and say, what the hell are you doing? Are you a baby? More jealous, more quarrelous. Oh, yeah. 
Punjab University, government college, Lums University, you look at any university and you look at the gender uh, distribution of grades and the women are always scoring higher than the men. Always. It's shocking. It's terrible. How can this be? Achha, uh, also more wakeful, alert, more shrinking and more difficult to rouse to action. So maybe that means le more risk averse, which is also a well-proven fact that there are more risk. So that's not so bad, <laughs> is it? Okay. Okay, I've got into more trouble here. The male is by nature superior and the female inferior. The one rules and the other is ruled. Woman is to man as a slave is to the master. How am I going to defend that? The manual to the mental worker, the barbarian to the Greek. Women are barbarians. <laughs> Woman is weak of will and therefore incapable of independence of character or position. The courage of a man is seen in commanding. And that of woman, woman in obeying. I can't believe. I can't. <laughs> what can I do for you? State should determine the minimum and maximum age of marriage for each sex the best season for conception, and the rate of population increase. When you get married, when you have kids, and how many kids you have, all should be determined by the state. Uh, women should be confined to female quarters. A woman's, per <laughs> a woman's personal becomes her husband. I don't understand what I was trying to write over there. But, all, but, but, after all of that, a society cannot be happy unless women are happy. <laughs> okay, right. Thanks, Mr. Aristotle, for that wonderful insight. Also, Aristotle justified slavery. He said, slaves are basically, you know, they're tools. They're tools with a voice. Men are by nature are divided into two groups. Those who are rulers by nature and those who submit by nature. Uh, but he could not explain why the slaves also had leaders. So if the slaves have leaders then the, and the leaders are also taken slaves, then that means that they were not by nature submissive, right? Uh, he excluded slaves from his entire political framework, as did Plato, you know. He only meant it for Greeks, as did Plato, as you know. Non-Greeks, of course, were always enslaved in ancient Greece. Slaves as property, he said, were necessary for the maintenance of a family. The family was the essential unit of the state, so private property became indirectly necessary to the state. Protection of property was important to the state, but not paramount. So, um, in fact, the word family in the English language, derived from the Roman, etc., did not just mean the man, the, hus the husband, and the wife, and the children. It also meant the retinue of slaves that were there with the family. So, it, the, the slavery was considered essential for a good family life. Okay. Aristotle, despite his strengths and weaknesses, had an enormous influence. In fact, you can say that till the arrival of Newton, <coughs> all of science, natural science, was dominated by this patriarchal guy. 
Um, and he also had a very big influence on Muslims and on Arabs. Uh, Muslims, in fact, called Aristotle the first teacher, the great teacher. Um, and they called Al-Farabi the second teacher. Because he was, and most of your Islamic philosophy, including Ibn Sina and Al-Farabi and Al-Kindi and Ibn Rush, is basically inspired by Aristotle, not by Plato. In fact, if we were to make a, a division, what you discover is that Plato is chiefly influential in the Western Roman Empire, Neoplatonism in the Eastern Roman Empire, and Aristotle dominates the Muslim Empire. The legacy of Aristotle was continued by Islamic scholars, and it was through Islamic scholars, in fact, that Western Europe in particular rediscovered Plato, because when Ibn Rushd wrote the comment, his commentaries on Aristotle, where he explained what Aristotle was saying. Paragraph by paragraph, he explained what Aristotle was saying. Uh, he wrote a commentary on each paragraph. Uh, it was phenomenal. It, that is when a whole school of thought amongst the Christians was created that followed uh, Ib, uh, Ibn Rushd, called Averroes uh, in Latin. And the Averroists then reintroduced Aristotle to Christianity, causing a sea tide, a big change in their thinking. So although Aristotle may have some very, very dark thoughts about women and slaves, dark thoughts that were not peculiar to him, by the way, because if you know anything about the medieval period, you know that whether it's the, you know, the Western uh, Hemisphere or the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, you know, these sort of ideas about women as being inferior to men were quite you know, preponderant in that period in, nearly, in many, many different parts of the world. <clears throat> But his great contribution to human civilization uh, is, uh, his, uh, are his, uh, 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 is how he not only critiqued Plato, but in response to Platonism, developed an entire epistemology based on materialism, based on an examination of the real world. And then he de de developed an entire uh, logical methodology a deductive as well as an inductive approach to understand the various facets of nature and society. It's not for his conclusions, perhaps, that Aristotle should be most appreciated. Many of his conclusions were absolutely incorrect. For example, I think he believed that women had more teeth than men. All he had to do was say to his <laughs> wife, say, ah, please, let me cover your teeth. And he would have discovered that that's not the case. Maybe he lost some teeth. Maybe that's why he thought that, you know, I don't know. The point is, many of his conclusions are wrong on procreation, on women, on slaves, etc. But the methodology he gave, we cannot take away, credit away from Aristotle, that along with Plato, these are the two great thinkers of Western philosophy who really stimulated our thinking, stimulated the thinking of generations that came after him. If Plato gave us a certain, uh, a certain code about how knowledge is virtue, and how the attainment of knowledge is the highest end that, that mankind can aspire to. An idea that most of us would not have any difficulty subscribing to, even when we have difficulty subscribing to many of other Plato's ideas. <clears throat> and if Plato was deeply, deeply influential in, uh, in, in articulating and changing the way in which uh, uh, religious philosophy developed, particularly through Neoplatonism, most of what you call uh, mysticism, including your Sufi thought, which derives from Ibn Arabi, etc., most of your mysticism, whether Christian mysticism or Muslim mysticism, is pure Neoplatonism. It's totally derived from Plato, right? Many of our ideas about the soul, about the afterlife, about, uh, uh, you know, uh, about ethics, etc., they are deeply, deeply inspired by Plato. The Republic is not the book that was most famous or most famous of Plato's book in the Middle Ages. The Timaeus and other books were more famous in which Plato talks about his, his, uh, his um, uh, epistemology and his metaphysics, etc. So deeply influential. But if you want to look at science and the investigation of nature and society through inductive and deductive reasoning, uh, you know, uh, a classification of knowledge, division of knowledge, and all of these things, then I think really we've got to give enormous credit to this man here, Aristotle, whose ideas, I mean, consider that in, in the world of matter and physics, his fundamental ideas dominated till Newton, yeah. Newton, this is two, three hundred years ago. That's it. I'm completely swept 
you know, 2,000 years of our history, and all our most advanced ideas were based on this one guy, on his work. It's phenomenal. You could be that one guy <laughs> for the next 2,000 years. Who knows? So, um, so yeah. So that's Aristotle in a nutshell. Uh, and I think I'd like to go back before I end to that beautiful picture that I showed you in the beginning. This one here, uh, which is this wonderful re intellectual relationship and com camaraderie, and yet also conflict and, and um, uh, 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 struggle between these two great masters of Western philosophy, Plato, who believed that they were ideal forms upon which everything was based, and deeply influenced religion, and Aristotle, who was a, so you can say Plato was an idealist. He believed that the ideas, and the ideal forms, were the, <coughs> the real things that determine everything in this world. <coughs> so the idealist on the one hand, not idealist in the, in the common use of the English word, which is, oh, this boy is very idealist, he believes in principles, but idealist in the sense that the world of matter is a world of illusion, the world of ideas is the, is the real world which we need to understand. <coughs> Aristotle, who was a materialist, looking to the earth, looking to the senses, looking to all the various things that exist in the earth, and, and trying to collect them and to, and to you know, uh, classify them and divide them and organize them and then deriving from them uh, knowledge that would help us understanding, understand how they work uh, uh, using both deduction, induction and so on and trying to pass through our knowledge through the prisms of, uh, of syllogisms and logic and so on and try to discern uh, about them what was truthful and not. Uh, these are the two great thinkers uh, that I can think of. And their political approaches match their epistemology. Plato constructing an ideal republic and then seeing whether the actually existing, how closely the actually existing republics accord to the ideal that he feels accords to human nature, to the nature within our heads and uh, chest and our, uh, and our stomach, etc. And Aristotle beginning right at the opposite end. If Plato is beginning from this ideal republic, he is beginning from the material reality of what actually exists, the actual political formations that exist, and then trying to piece together how politics works in the real world. Uh, so on that note, I'd like to end today's lecture. There was a time.